Hello, today we're going to continue on that infamous cesium problem. We had all those transitions that uh, we were supposed to assign the quantum numbers for and we were asked if we could estimate the ionization energy or ionization potential, same thing. And of course we can, otherwise uh, we wouldn't ask that. Today then we're going to finish that problem, the energy level diagram problem. We're going to talk about spin-orbit coupling a little bit and then we're going to talk a little bit about multiple electron atoms and the Pauli principle as kind of an introduction to much more complicated systems that we're going to be dealing with in the future. Recall that we had assigned the two resonance lines for cesium. Those are the two strongest lines in the emission spectrum which were from uh, doublet P three halves and doublet P one half to the ground state doublet S one half. And the splitting between the P states was a very large value of 554 wave numbers which is the spin orbit coupling for the 6P electron. So let's pick up then where we left off. We had this fragment of the energy level diagram that I've redrawn here on slide 414. And we had these two transitions assigned, 11178 and 11732. Uh, now we look at the other sets of lines. And what we look for is whether there's a difference of 554. And we start with the set of lines that there's just two of them and then there's a semicolon. So this problem, the key is, especially if you get this on an exam, is that the semicolons mean something. That means that they're giving you a hint and ordering them. If they just give you a list of lines without any kind of ordering, the problem is far, far harder to do. And they didn't want it to be that hard, but it's plenty hard as it is. If we look at the other two lines, um, 7, 3, 5, 7, and we subtract 6, 8, 0, 3 from it, those two went together, that difference is 554. And what that means is that there must be some level that is going to both those P states. If it's just two, that means it's an S state. And so what we think is that down here we've got 6S, and the P is coming down here, so that's the 554 from those, and that's quite a big energy difference. And then closer to the P is the 7S, now up here, and it can make a transition to both of those, that's allowed, just like, right, either way. And so if we're above, we can emit, and we emit those two lines, go to there, and then those two both go to the bottom, so these things can happen sequentially. And of course, when we look at the spectrum, we don't have any kind of time resolution usually. We're just looking at all, all the stuff that comes out. Uh, we don't keep track. It's just developing uh, things on a CCD camera or on film. If we assume that's a 7S, then we have now this picture on slide 416. We have the 6S, the 6P split into two levels, the 7S is a single level, again, doublet S one half, and we have those two lines, 7357 to the lower state and 6803 to the upper state. Now, what we have by adding these numbers up is we have the energy difference between 6S and 7S and that's how we're going to estimate the ionization energy in a little bit. The other sets are grouped into three and what I've done then is I've just taken the three and I've taken all possible differences between them. One minus two, one minus three, two minus three. I've arranged them as positive numbers. 3321 minus 2865 is 456 wave numbers. I haven't seen that. 3321 minus 2767 is 554. That I have seen. 
So that's the hint that whatever is involved in these three is going to the same two there, these central guys in this scheme that are my linchpin for figuring out how this stuff works. And then the other one, 2865 minus 2767 is 98. So that's another dud as far as I'm concerned right now. I don't know exactly what the 98 or the 456 means. But I can guess, if there's three of them, that it involves a D term. Why? Because I've got uh, doublet P one half and three halves. When I go to doublet D, I have, by the Klepsch Gordon, three halves and five halves. Well, the three halves can go to both the three halves, that's delta J equals zero, and the one half, that's delta J minus one, and the five halves can only go to the doublet P three halves, because it's not allowed to go from five halves to one half. So I expect to see three lines. I expect to see two of them from the lower D state to the two. Those two should have a difference of 554. Well, there is a pair with a difference of 554, so I'm going to assume that's what that is, and then the others have to come out to be the other difference. And so let's have a look then at what that means. Uh, well, let's do the same thing with the uh, other, with the other uh, set of three. Why, why, why do they have a much larger value? Well, they must be from another D state that's higher in energy coming down again. And if I take the 11,411 minus 10,900, I get another value I haven't seen, 511. But if I take the 11,411 minus 10,867, bingo, 554. There's a level, again, coming down to those two P states. And if I take the third difference, I get a splitting of 43. The uh, 554 is the spin orbit splitting in the P state. I expect the D state to be lower than that. And so I'm going to sort of assume that the small value is the splitting in the D state, and that's how I'm going to uh, try to assign them. Now, we don't know what the quantum number of the D level is. We've got 6s, 6p, 7s, that's, that's pretty much set. And then we've got 5d and maybe 6d. But we have to figure out if 5d is below 6p in energy, so it could be going this way, down, or if it's above in energy. And the way uh, we do that, we, so we had to do a bit of thinking here. Uh, it's probably 5D, but we don't know for sure if it's below or not. But if we do put them, the 5D below, and then we assign the transitions to get the 554, then what we find is that the spin orbit splitting in the D state there would have to be 456 wave numbers that would be it. And that's far too big for a D state. So you have to know a little bit of trivial knowledge in order to get it for sure, and that is that it shouldn't be that big. And therefore, it's the other way around. It's, it's the 90 and the 40 that are the splitting in the D state. And in fact, both the D levels are higher than the 6P. And if you make that assumption, then we get the um, complicated diagram on this slide here. We have the ground state, the 6s, we've got the 6p states, those two, we've got the 7s, then over here we've got the two states in the 5d, and then we've got the two states in the 6d, and we've got all these transitions assigned, and we've got all the quantum numbers assigned. And so assigning all the quantum numbers you can means assigning every single one of them for every single transition in this case. Now the question is, how are we going to figure out 
the ionization potential. Well, if we didn't know about that formula, minus r over n minus delta l quantity squared, we would never get anywhere because we, if we assume that it goes like hydrogen with 6 and 7, um, we get totally the wrong answer in this case. We have two ways of estimating the ionization energy, and I'm going to estimate the ionization energy both ways. I'm first going to use the S, the 6S and the 7S, and then as a check, I'm going to use the 5D and the 6D, and we'll learn a little bit about how to do that because these are split, and so the question is which one do you use, and the answer is neither of them. You have to figure out how to figure out what the center of gravity is for those transitions. If we add the 11,178 and the 7,357, what we get is 18,535 wave numbers for the difference between 6s and 7s. So that's delta E in wave numbers. And now we have that formula, and the difference then must be minus r times 1 over 7 minus delta L quantity squared minus 1 over 6 de minus delta L quantity squared. And uh, this is a quadratic equation basically to solve for delta L, and we know the value of R, 109737. We should actually use the corrected value, but for cesium, the, the reduced mass is essentially the mass of the electron, and so the Rydberg constant is so-called R infinity uh, which is very close to 109737. So we'll just use that. And then we have a constraint on what delta L can be because um, we have to be careful because we can get different roots of, of a quadratic equation. It has to be real, it has to be positive, and it has to be less than 6. And with those constraints on the possibility of the solution, what we find is the delta S for the cesium atom is 4.15. This is an enormous defect um, compared to 6. It's subtracting off this huge uh, number. Well, that, that, that actually makes sense when you consider all the electrons that are around there and the penetration to the, uh, to the nucleus. And then we can figure out the ionization potential from the sixth state because then we can just put in um, n equals infinity for the state, take the difference, and that's just r over um, 6 minus the quantum defect quantity squared. So we take 6 minus 4.15, we square it um, and divide 109737 by that, and we get 32,063 wave numbers. That's our estimate for the ionization potential of cesium based on just having two levels there. Um, that's a little bit dicey because usually you'd like to have many more than just two to see what the trend is. Now let's also try to get an estimate from the D states. For one thing, that's going to confirm that the quantum numbers that we've assigned are correct, and for another thing, um, it's probably going to give us a, a, a better value because um, there's less distortion in the D states. They behave more ideally. But in order to do so, we can't, we've got these two uh, sets here. This one's split by 90-something and this is 40-something. We, we need to have two levels which are sort of the unperturbed D state energies before we have the spin-orbit coupling, so we didn't have to deal with that with the S states. And the way you do that is you have to weight the um, two states by their multiplicity, and you have to take the weighted mean. Though the three halves has more substates than, the, uh, excuse me, the, the five halves has more substates than the three halves, and we get a ratio of six to four for the states, or 3 to 2. And therefore, I, I've shown on these um, 
two equations, the difference between the 5D state and the 6S state, because I only have the difference, I don't have the absolute, is two times the difference to the lower level, which is uh, 11178 plus 3321, plus three times the difference to the upper level, which is the same thing, plus the 98, divided by 5. Or I could have taken 6 and 4 divided by 10, if I'm actually counting the states. Therefore, the energy difference, the, be, the correct zero of energy for the 5D versus the 6S is 14,557.8 wave numbers higher. And if we do the same thing with the 6D, versus the 6S, we get a difference of 22,614.8 wave numbers. And now what we can do is we can take the difference between those two numbers. And then we have the difference between 6D and 5D because whatever the difference is to S drops out of the equation. And using that difference of 8057, we can then solve for the quantum defect in the D state by solving minus R times 1 over 6 minus delta sub D quantity squared minus 1 over 5. And again, we have a constraint that the solution be real, that it be positive, and that it be less than 5. And the uh, allowed value then of the quantum defect in the D state is 2.43, which is less than S. And recall I said the quantum defect um, gets smaller as you go out. It becomes more ideal. Using that, we can get the ionization potential. We first take R over 5 minus the quantum defect squared. But then what we have to do is we have to add the energy it took to get up there from the 6S. So we've now got an estimate from here from this formula, and then we've got, we got to get up there. So we take that plus 11178 plus 3321, and we get 31,198 wave numbers, which is a little bit different than the S state, but close, very close considering the way we're uh, doing this with this approximate formula and two levels. And so really comforting if you get a result like this when it counts and you're going to get a grade on it. In fact, the literature value is 3.894 electron volts, which converts to 31,324 wave numbers. Therefore, the estimate from the D states is, with their smaller quantum defect is closer to the accepted value. What I would say is that if you haven't um, been trained to look at problems like this and, and you're just given a problem like this cold and you just know something about the hydrogen atom, a problem like this is pretty much nearly impossible. And um, once you know how to do them and how to look for these common differences, then pretty much you can get everything done. Although, um, if it's not an alkali metal, it's going to be much, much harder. Uh, and it just depends whether, whether you'll be able to estimate the ionization potential or not. You may meet, need more data. If in this problem we had more data, what we'd try to do is we try to organize the data rather than just solving um, two equations uh, and one equation and one unknown, rather, and then, and then inferring the ionization energy. We'd try to make a plot where the ionization energy would be the intercept, and we would try to organize our variables so that the plot were linear, and then what we'd do is we'd check whether the plot is linear first, so that we know we're doing the right thing, and then we would um, zoom in and, and uh, get the ionization energy. Okay, let's take a little bit more detailed look at spin-orbit coupling, this magnetic interaction. We never included it in the Hamiltonian. We had the kinetic energy of the electron. We had factored out the nuclear motion, the potential energy, the electrostatic energy. And then we said later, hey, there's this magnetic thing. 
but how could we include it if we wanted to include it? Uh, we argued that the electron sees a magnetic field from the nucleus going around the other way, and that's why there's only a spin orbit splitting in non-S states. But we could do a little bit better than that because we know that the energy of a bar magnet or any dipole, an electric dipole and an electric field or a magnetic dipole and a magnetic field, is minus mu dot b um, or minus mu dot e. And uh, if in f the, the uh, magnetic moment is proportional to s, the spin, and if the uh, magnetic field is proportional to L, the orbital angular momentum, then we get an energy term which has some number, which I'm going to call beta, times L dot S, because that should be the dot product of the two, and energies are often dot products, and forces are often cross products, and that's the way things play out then we can cast the uh, dot product in terms of things that we actually know. We want to get it in terms of quantum numbers. So we can do a trick. We can take j dot j, that's a scalar product of the total angular momentum of the atom with itself, or j squared, and substituting for j l plus s in each place, we get l squared, which is l dot l, plus s squared, which is s dot s, plus 2 l dot s. And then we just solve that for l dot s, which was going to be our energy term there. And we get 1 half j squared minus l squared minus s squared. And now, if we know the quantum numbers, we can just put in numbers for those things. And um, we don't have to worry about what the operators are, we just put in numbers. Let's apply that to the doublet p three halves and doublet p one half states. We know all the quantum numbers. We know s, we know l, we know j. So we're going to take the expectation value of the spin orbit energy in these states. Well, what we find then, when we put in the quantum numbers, we get beta over two, beta some thing that has to do with how strong the interaction is. We'll get to that in a second. Then we get for j squared, j, little j times little j plus 1, that's how that works, minus little l times little l plus 1, minus little s times little s plus 1. If we do that for doublet p three halves, we simply get 15 over 4 minus 2 minus 3 over 4 beta over 2. And, and so we get beta over 2 times h bar squared. And if we do it for 3p one half, uh, uh, excuse me, doublet p one half, what we get is minus beta h bar squared. And you can see one of them is moved up by a certain amount, and the other is moved down. And that's why when we did the problem, we took the weighted mean, because they're moved by different amounts depending on the multiplicity so that the center of gravity remains the same. The shift, whatever it is, this energy term beta, should depend on z, the atomic number, because after all we saw with cesium it was much, much bigger than sodium, and we would expect a bigger nucleus to generate a bigger magnetic field. But it's going to take us far too far afield to actually calculate this from first principles with the Thomas Fermi precession and all this other stuff that comes in. Um, so I'm just going to quote the answer that h bar squared beta, the energy term in front of the L dot s, goes like z to the fourth and then a magnetic conversion factor and then the g factor of the electron, the Bohr magneton, and then this term that comes from doing some angular momentum algebra, 1 over n cubed times a naught cubed times L times L plus 1 times L plus 1 half. So it's quite a long and involved formula. But what it shows is that as n and L increase, the splitting decreases. And we saw that again in the, in the cesium. We saw that one of them was 90-something, the other was 40-something that's higher up. And so that makes sense. 
okay, let's talk about two electron atoms. So we did hydrogen, we did alkali metals, which are kind of a dodge because they're just basically one electron and then, and then this cloud of charge inside. And now if we want to actually do a two electron atom, then we have to start doing some serious work because um, we have to take into account what's going on with the two electrons and that isn't so easy to see until you've had some experience with it. With the hydrogen atom, we noted that we had a 6 plus 1 dimensional problem if, when we started out. Six dimensions in space, the three coordinates of the proton, the three coordinates of the electron, and then one dimension in time. And what we decided is, well, we aren't solving for a time dependence. If we just want the static ground state um, time independent answer, we could get rid of uh, time in the time dependent Schrodinger equation and just calculate the energy eigenstates because the energy eigenstates are the states that don't change in time. That's why they're special. And then how did we get rid of the other three coordinates? Well, recall we factored out the center of mass motion, which is just the whole atom drifting around. And then we, what we were left with is just the relative distance between the proton and the electron. And then at that point, we can make a mental dodge and say, well, look, the proton's fixed, the distance is to the electron, and at that point, we just start thinking about the coordinate in terms of where the electron is in the hydrogen atom. But for hydride, let's say H minus, that has a proton and two electrons, big fluffy thing, very strong reducing agent. Or helium, not quite so big and fluffy and not very reactive. The wave function is six dimensional even after we take out the motion of the nucleus. Why? Because we've got two electrons. And so as I remarked earlier, we can't comprehend how to plot six dimensional things very well. And so we promptly get rid of all that complexity and we say, look, we have to take some kind of a simpler approach that's more tractable. We aren't going to write a wave function as a function of uh, six coordinates and then try to figure out what's going on, even if we can solve that sort of thing, which even three um, where things separated nicely wasn't so easy. And in this case, they aren't going to separate because uh, even for a three-body problem, they don't separate. Oh, we can't disentangle the electrons from each other so simply. So what we do is what we always do. When we don't like something, we throw it away. That's the first step. I don't like that term in the equation. Well, okay, let's assume it's small. And then if it isn't small, let's try to figure out how to fix it later. But first, let's get an answer that we can get. And so in this case, the term that's a pain is the electron-electron repulsion. The fact that these two electrons are buzzing around somehow, and whenever they get close to each other, uh, they really repel like crazy because they can, in principle, get very close. After all, they're almost geometric points. So that would give an extremely high energy, and that can happen anywhere in space where they are. So they try to avoid each other and then they try to also cluster around the nucleus and if we just ignore their repulsion we can just treat them separately. I don't see you. You don't see me. We both see this guy. Let's try to get an estimate then and then um, correct it. In that case if we ignore the repulsion then the energy is just the sum of the energy of this electron interacting with the nucleus and the sum of this electron interacting with the nucleus. And if the energies add, that means the wave function is a product because that's basically what we did with the particle in a box. We said, look, the, the EX and EY energies just add up. That means the wave function factorizes into a product because those guys have nothing to do with each other. And if we turn off the repulsion between the electrons, 
they have nothing to do with each other. There's no forces between them. And so for these two electrons, instead of a wave function, let's, let's say a function of R1 comma R2, which is six coordinates, we break it up right away into a, a product, psi of R1 time, or psi 1 of R1 times psi 2 of R2. We just right away assume that. And that's our starting. Once we assume a product of wave functions that depends only on one set of coordinates, what we're doing essentially is we're putting each electron into its own orbital. This is an important concept. I've mentioned the term orbital before. For a hydrogen atom, there is only one electron. But for multi-electron atoms, there are lots of electrons, and the wave function is a big mess. But we don't want to deal with the big mess, so what we do is we put each electron into its own orbital. This is an approximation. It's a pretty good one in a lot of cases, and it's called the orbital approximation. It lets us consider um, each wave function for each electron to be only dependent on the coordinates of that electron. You can see right away that that can't be right because how, how do you know what, what this one's doing if you don't know where this one is when they're repelling? But nevertheless, it can be a pretty good approximation and it's the one we use. Now we don't have to stick with the hydrogen orbitals for the solution. We can. Why? Because the hydrogen orbitals form a complete set. Remember what we learned about the eigenfunctions of any Hermitian operator, that they're orthogonal to each other. So we can consider them as a different uh, directions and we can make up any function we like as combinations of these hydrogen functions. And since we know what they are and we can write them all down, that can be really attractive. But we don't have to stick just with them. Um, we can uh, take any kind of functions that we like, a Gaussian function or, or any other thing, and then what we can do is adjust the electrons in sequence, going round and round and round, until we get a better solution. We'll talk more about that later on in this series of lectures. That's a so-called self-consistent field model. But um, you can understand what it's going to amount to pretty easily. I've got all these electrons. They're all over the place. They're repelling they're, and, and so forth. And they're attracted to the nucleus. And I don't know what's going on. And it's a 27-dimensional problem. What I do is I put all the electrons into shells, into orbitals, like they would be in the hydrogen atom, but with an appropriate value of z. And then I take one electron and I take all the others and I smear them out into charge. I just forget the fact that they're a real wave function there and I just smear them out into some charge distribution. And then I take the one electron I've got and I've got this weird charge distribution from all the other ones and the nucleus and I take this electron and I try to optimize its wave function until it lowers the energy so that it's more ideal. And then I freeze it and make it into the charge and I pick another electron so I have always n minus 1 and then I have one left over and I go round and round and round and when I can't improve it anymore then I say I've got a self-consistent solution. Doesn't mean it's correct, in fact it's not correct because the problem, smearing it into a charge is pretty good but it's not the same as taking into account how things are actually moving, so-called electron correlation. And in fact, other theories are much better at doing that. Um, once we're done, it, let's say we've got go back to two electron atom. Let's forget the 27-dimensional one. If we go back and we've got two electrons in the atom, we can treat the electron-electron repulsion as a perturbation. And then we can try to adjust the energies to see if we get something that's more acceptable, that measures better with these spectroscopic lines, which of course 
can be measured to many, many digits, which is a great test between theory and experiment. If you look back at the slides on perturbation theory, remember that we, start, we, we introduced this parameter that I called lambda, and when lambda was zero, we had our uh, unperturbed solution that we had the exact solution for. And then when lambda is equal to one, we have what we're trying to get, and we tried to connect, piece together, zero and one by taking a power series in lambda on both sides of the equation and matching the powers, because if it's going to match all the way through, the various powers should match. And after we match the powers, we get some equations, and then to get rid of lambda, we just set lambda equals to one, and then it's out of there, and then we have some equations to solve. And if you look back at that, then there's a correction to the energy right away when you have a perturbation, as long as it doesn't, as long as it has non-zero um, matrix elements, and the correction of the wave function is higher up. So you need a higher order calculation if you're actually going to correct the wave function itself for the atom from this product to something better than that. But there's another player in the game now, and we have to take a look at that. Before the spin, okay, one electron spin orbit coupling, but now the spin is going to play a major role if we got two electrons because that's going to dictate which um, states we can even have, and we have to be very careful. And the spin is kind of an annoyance because it doesn't have these variables r, theta, and phi. It's just this quantum number, m sub s plus or minus a half. But because they can't have the same quantum numbers, it dictates everything. So there are two principles here. The Pauli exclusion principle is usually stated in the following terms. That um, two electrons in the same atomic orbital or with all uh, the same spatial quantum numbers, sp same spatial orbital, have to have opposite spin. They cannot have the same spin. If one of them's up, the other is down. It's not quite literally true, but we'll see what it means. And there, this turns out to be a result of a much deeper um, symmetry principle, which is this, the, just the Pauli principle, which is uh, a principle that applies to all fermions. Fermions, uh, electrons are fermions. And the idea is that if you take the total wave function of your atom and you swap any two identical particles, to fermions, then the wave function changes sign. That's okay that the wave function changes sign because when you square it, the probability density is the same. Of course, if you're exchanging mentally um, two identical particles, physically, you could argue you've done nothing at all. So, of course, the um, electron density, the probability uh, distribution of charge shouldn't change. And of course, it doesn't change, but the wave function can change sign, and it does if we swap. So if we write a function and we swap um, what we call electron one with electron two everywhere in the function, then it should change sign of the wave function. If it doesn't, it's not allowed. Okay, as I, rec as I mentioned, the probability density stays the same. And then there's another one, a boson, which is a, of which a photon is an example. And that one, if you, if you swap them, it doesn't change sign. It just stays the same sign. And it appears that these two particles have completely different properties mathematically in terms of our equations. One of them always changes sign. The other one doesn't change sign. And you could ask, well, why is it always one or minus one? Maybe, maybe it could change by e to the i theta, um, and it would still have the same uh, probability density if, if the other one changed by e to the minus i theta, and, and uh, everything would come out in the wash. And the answer is, 
maybe there are some things like that called anions, and if you're, you, if you're intrigued about those, you can look them up. But as far as we're concerned with atoms, it either changes sign or doesn't. And since we're only concerned with electrons, what we're really concerned about is this change of sign in the wave function when we swap the thing. Now it's the total wave function that changes sign. And the wave function, when we've got more than one electron, what we have to worry about is the spatial part, which depends on the coordinates, and the spin part which is just grafted on. But the spin part can change sign too because if I've got two electrons, if they're both up, then if I swap them, nothing changed. If one's up and one's down and I swap them, I get something different. And so that's no good. Um, if they're both down and I swap them, nothing changed. And so what's going to have to happen is if we have the two electrons with the same, um, spin, then the spatial part is going to have to be the part that changes sign. The spatial part has to be anti-symmetric if the spin part is symmetric. And the spin part has to be anti-symmetric if the spatial part is symmetric. If the two electrons are in the same orbital, the spatial part is symmetric because if I swap them, they're the same orbital. That has to be completely symmetric. And so that's why they have to have opposite spin. That's the ex uh, exclusion principle. Let's uh, have a look then at how this uh, plays out. We never included the spin explicitly with hydrogen. Um, we, we didn't say, hey, um, in this single electron, uh, was it, let's go back and figure out if it's spin up and spin down. And that's because unless you look extremely closely um, it doesn't matter whether it's spin up or spin down. Um, only if you worried about the proton spin as well does, does that matter. But when we've got two electrons, it is the major thing to keep track of. And you have to keep track of it and you have to learn how to do it. Let's um, have a look then at how to do this. Let's abbreviate our wave function here on slide 437 as just psi of 1 comma 2. And 1 is, is electron 1 and 2 is electron 2. And it's going to depend on the spatial part and, and the spin part. Then the anti-symmetry constraint of the total wave function for the atom means this. Psi of 1 comma 2 is equal to minus psi of 2 comma 1. That's it. If I have a wave function and it doesn't satisfy that, it's no good. I can't use it. And that's going to throw out a lot of possible solutions. So that's for the total wave function. Now suppose the two electrons have the same orbital part. Let's call that psi 1 and psi 2. They have the same function for each electron. It could be e to the minus r over a naught or whatever. It's the same. That part's symmetric because if I swap them, it's the same. And so the spin part has to be um, anti-symmetric in that case. Because typesetting books, especially with arrows, historically is incredibly tedious, uh, especially before computer typesetting, usually instead of using these arrows, what we use is alpha for one spin state and beta for the other. And we just write them in order. Uh, and the order is the order of the electrons. So what we can do is we can write um, the four combinations like this. Alpha 1, alpha 2. That's they're both up. Alpha 1, beta 2. Beta 1, alpha 2. And beta 1, beta 2. Those are the four combinations. And um, the alpha, alpha, and beta, beta states are symmetric, as I said. The other ones are neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric. And that means the other ones are no good. And as we saw when we took two electrons and coupled them, what we have to do is we have to make a proper value of big S for those 
And remember, one value went with the triplet and the other went with the singlet. And that's exactly what we have to do here. So taking the same thing that we did when we took two, two electrons spin one halves to get big S, we get a symmetric combination, which is root 2 over 2 alpha beta plus beta alpha. And the other combination, which is anti-symmetric, which is root 2 over 2 alpha beta minus beta alpha. And only the, uh, so the first combination is symmetric, the second is anti-symmetric. And it, you can see that if you actually substitute, if you just swap them around. You have to swap them around and then look carefully at them, and you'll see that the second one changes sign. And I've shown that here on slide 440. Since the combination is symmetric, then three out of four of these spin wave functions are no good. The alpha alpha, beta beta, and alpha beta plus beta alpha are all no good. So those were the S equals 1 uh, or triplet states. And it's only the anti-symmetric singlet state, S equals 0. So it's not really that the two electrons, one is up and one is down. Remember, this is quantum mechanics, so it's always weirder than we think. It's a 50-50 mixture of I'm up and you're down minus you're up and I'm down. That's what it is, not just one combination, because that wouldn't have the right symmetry either. And that part then, sig what I've called sigma minus here, can pair with the spatial part. And we get the overall wave function for this two electron system, if they're in the same orbital, which they would be, let's say, for helium is psi 1, psi 2, times sigma minus uh, 1, 2. And that will be um, where we pick up next time when we actually try to figure out, okay, we've got these electrons. Let's try to actually calculate some energies for these atoms. Let's have a look at, at how it plays out and how we can take into account the repulsive terms between the electrons. And that, that's quite a, an interesting little exercise. There's a lot of mathematics, but most of it we can uh, sort of bludgeon our way through with the help of some um, friends that know how to do a lot of integrals that we're going to have to be able to do to get them down to a number at the end and then see what that number is and how much the energy shifts. So we'll pick it up there next time through.